We are uh, so excited uh, to have Major Jeff Struker here with us today. You are vaguely familiar with his story if you have seen uh, the movie Black Hawk Down. Uh, maybe you have gone online and researched a little bit more about him. But you're going to hear a powerful testimony this morning. I want you to check out this video, and then we're going to introduce our speaker this morning. I drove these roads 20 years ago. Really? Yes. 1993. 1993, yes. All right, so anything on your right should be the Wolcott crash site. I was parked right here. In fact, if you look at all the bullet holes around here, most of these are from us. Yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit anxious right now. Wishing that I had some more guns around me. Hey, Kenny, you know that we're in the Bacara market right now, right? I can't wait. What nobody has done at this point from Task Force Ranger, nobody has gone back there. There's been so many opportunities to get out of doing this, and then something keeps stepping in to make it happen. Obviously, Mogadishu is a dangerous city no matter what. I think in the next couple of hours, if you're not out of the city, it's going to start to get real ugly out there. We all saw the first helicopter got shot down. Put me in, coach. That's what all of us were thinking. There is a great deal of violence in the movie Black Hawk Down. It is a fraction of what really happened. And ever since I left Mogadishu, death has really never had the impact on me that it had before Mogadishu. It is? That's your house? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, we did a lot of shooting back here 20 years ago by your house. You may welcome to Liberty this morning a great American hero, Major Jeff Struker. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have been looking forward to this for some time. Liberty, thank you for inviting me to be with you on Freedom Sunday. And for all of you that are here, I'm excited to be with you. For those that are at the Fort Oglethorpe campus, I hope this week has been a great celebration of your freedom. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to ask you to open it up. You don't have to turn there just yet, but we're going to take a look at one verse in the Bible. It's found in John chapter 8. Just go ahead and flip that open, put something in there, a little bookmark, and I'm going to take a few moments to give you a little bit of my story and try to help you ex understand what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8 because he talks about freedom in this passage of Scripture in ways that I think a lot of people in his day didn't understand what he meant. And quite frankly, if you were to uh, interview the average American, I don't think they would understand what Jesus is talking about until you come into a room like this and meet folks who have been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we understand freedom in ways that people that don't know Christ will never get it. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up in the army and eventually how I ended up in Somalia and the events of Black Hawk Down. I grew up, um, I, I grew up with, with parents that divorced when, they were, when I was pretty young. I didn't grow up in church. In fact, my family really never went to church except for maybe for a funeral. And I also grew up moving from place to place, so I didn't really have a, a much of a, a family background, much of a church background, and I, the, the, my earliest memories, I mean, from as far back as I can remember, the thing that really uh, stuck with me from childhood was I grew up with this overwhelming fear of dying. Now, I'm not talking about the, you know, childhood curiosity. I'm talking about this absolutely certain that one day I'm going to die. And because I didn't grow up in church, I didn't know what happens next. So I can tell you for years, I'm talking seven, eight, nine, ten years old, I would wake up in the middle of the night totally terrified about what happens to you after you die. I'd wake my family up and I'd ask my mother or my sister the same question over and over again. I'd ask them, what happens to you after you die? And where do you go? And what is it like? 
And my family didn't go to church. They didn't know the answers. They just gave me the same standard answer that they had heard when they grew up. They told me, Jeff, after you die, you go to heaven. And it's awesome up there. And when I asked them, who gets to heaven and how do you get there? They didn't know the answers. So they basically said, everybody gets to heaven. Jeff, leave me alone. Go back to sleep. I'm tired. I'm tired of having this conversation with you. This went on for years, till I was 13 years old. Because at 13, we moved as a family to a little suburb right outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and we were living in an apartment complex right next door to this young married couple. I don't even remember their names to this day, but this couple took me in and treated me like a little brother. They hung out with me, wanted to play games with me, always wanted to spend time with me. I don't even know why. But one night, instead of coming over to their apartment, they asked if they could come talk to me. And I still remember this like it was yesterday, y'all, because they knocked on my door, and then they sat down at the dining room table, and they were really nervous. In fact, I remember they were stumbling all over themselves, and I kept thinking to myself, this is weird. What's wrong with these two? What's the problem? And they started to have a conversation with me the first time in my life anybody really explained to me who Jesus was. They said, Jeff, we just want to tell you what happened 2,000 years ago when a man named Jesus gave his life up in payment for your sins. Jeff, we want to tell you what he did for us. And we also want to tell you how he can absolutely change your life. Now, these two didn't know me well enough to know that I was really wrestling with this fear of dying. And so they said, Jeff, if you will surrender your soul to Jesus Christ, he will change your life right here, right now. He will give you abundant life. But not just that, he will handle once and for all what happens to you after you die. And I think they were so nervous that they just kind of left it like that. Like, hey, if this makes any sense to you, here's what you do next. And then they kind of ran away and left the house. And later on that night, I started thinking about what this couple was saying to me. And that night, I knelt by the side of my bed, and I surrendered to King Jesus, and he radically, totally changed me that night, 13 years old. Not only did Jesus change me, but he also took away this fear of dying, and he did it in an instant, kneeling by the side of my bed at 13 years old. I mean, I got up the next day, I went to school, I came back off of the school bus, and instead of going to my apartment, I went next door and knocked on the neighbor's door and said, I did what you guys said last night, and something is different inside of me, and I don't know what to do now. And they started taking me to church with them, and started sharing with me what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus. Fast forward a few years. I'm a senior in high school, and I've got no idea what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. So one day, I'm just about ready to graduate. I go to talk to some Army recruiters. I go to the recruiter's office, and I ask a simple question in the recruiter's office. I'm the only kid in the recruiter's office that day. I think I probably skipped school to go there. Um, but I'm at the recruiter's office, and I ask, what's the toughest job in the Army? Now, I didn't know anything about the military. I didn't have any military in my family to speak of. I'm just going there because I'm trying to figure out if this is something that might be cool to do for the next few years. And also, I've got this hidden agenda that I'm not about to tell the Army recruiters about because I'm afraid they'll think I'm crazy. First, I just want to know if I was tough enough to serve with the best of the best in the military. That's really why I asked the question, what's the toughest job in the Army? But the second reason why I asked that question is because if the U.S. was going to send soldiers off to combat, I wanted to have the chance to go. I wanted to see if I was really over this fear of dying. And so my recruiter, who was totally honest with me, he recommended that I enlist in the Army, that I go to Fort Benning, Georgia, where some of the greatest warriors on planet Earth are trained, and that I volunteer to serve as an infantryman, to go through the Airborne course, and to become a soldier in the 75th Ranger Regiment. 
It's a special operations unit stationed in Fort Benning, Georgia. I spent the next 10 years of my Army career there serving with y'all some of the best warriors this country has ever produced, men who are able to do on the battlefields what nobody else on planet Earth can do. Now, I didn't tell my friends when I showed up to the Army that I really wanted to have a chance to go to war because I wasn't sure if I'm over this fear of dying. I just simply tried every day to give it my all, to give it the best that I had, and to be able to, do, uh, to, to serve honorably with those guys that I had the privilege of serving with in the Army's 75th Ranger Regiment. In 1989, I'd been in the Army now for a couple of years, and the U.S. was about to invade the Republic of Panama. This is Operation Just Cause. And I was in a reconnaissance detachment of the Ranger Regiment, and we were getting notified that this thing is a very real possibility, but every time we got notified, it would get uh, canceled at the last second. So basically, this had been going on for months. Hey, we're going to go to war in Panama. You know what? They, they changed their mind in, at the White House. We're not going to war. And eventually, after some attack on U.S. servicemen down there in late 1980s, the U.S. decided to send an invasion force to the Republic of Panama. On December 20th, 1989, my unit conducted two parachute assaults. The Ranger Regiment seized airfields at Torrios de Cumán and Rio Hato in Panama in 1989. We put hundreds of aircraft in the skies on the night of the invasion, and we knew that it's possible some of those aircraft might get shot down. So I showed up about 24 hours before the invasion began and provided a search and rescue force for the air, uh, air, aircraft in the skies over the, over the country of Panama on the night of the invasion. For the next week or two, I was flying around Panama, hitting targets, trying to defeat the Panamanian Defense Forces. But really what our unit's mission was, as part of the Special Operations Force, is to capture the country's leader, Manuel Noriega. And after about a week and a half, we had already cornered Noriega. About two weeks into this thing, we had him in our custody and flying him back to the United States to stand trial for some crimes against the United States. And I got into a couple of firefights when I was in Panama. But these weren't life or death kind of things. These were just pretty intense, put the training to the test kind of firefights. And when I got back from Panama, there was still a lot about the military, frankly, a lot about myself that I still wanted to learn. I do remember, though, um, writing a little note to my family right before I left for the invasion of Panama. And this note basically said, if something happened to me when I was in war, here's the things that I regret not doing. And the number one thing on this note was I was head over heels in love with my high school sweetheart, but just didn't ask her to marry me. So number one on my list was, I'm going to propose, if I make it out of this combat uh, tour alive, I'm going to propose to my uh, high school sweetheart. So the first chance that I got after Panama, I bought a ring and flew back to our hometown, and I proposed, and Dawn and I set a date to get married about a year later. Now, if you're a history buff out there, you know that a year later, the U.S. is involved in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So I'm in Fort Benning, Georgia, in a special operations unit, She's halfway across the country in our hometown. We've already made all of the arrangements. We've set all of the details. We're just a few weeks away from our wedding day, and we've had a lot of plans and a lot of preparation. And then I had the chance to make a phone call, which almost never happens in a special operations unit because what they do is classified. I convinced my commander to let me make a phone call. And here's what this phone call went like. I said, Don, uh, I'm calling you over a non -class, uh, un unclassified phone line, so I can't tell you where I'm going, and I'm not authorized to tell you when I'm leaving or where I'm going to, and I don't know when I'm going to get back. But I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be in the country on our wedding day. 
And this is before the internet, right? So this is, there's no way to pull this thing off um, if you're halfway around the world from one another. And I remember there was a long pause on the phone, and she said, Jeff, if you're going to war again, we need to get married right away. I said, wait a second. I didn't say the word war. Nobody said anything about that. I just said I'm not going to be in the country on our wedding day. She may not remember this, but I tell you, she said, don't play games with me, Jeff. If you get killed, I want the flag. (laughs) If you're going to war again, if you're going to war, we need to get married right away. And I did what any smart man in this room would do. I said, yes, ma'am. And I got on a plane, and I flew back to our hometown. My plane landed at noon, and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, two hours later, we were getting married in our family church and then flying right back to Fort Benning, Georgia. And eventually, on my way to Kuwait as part of Operation Desert Storm. I got in a firefight in Kuwait, too. But it's nothing like I experienced in Black Hawk Down. In fact, that little video clip tells you that if you've seen the movie Black Hawk Down, it doesn't even show you a fraction of the real violence from the real thing. So by the time that I get to Somalia in 1993, I've been in the Army for six years. I'm a 24-year-old squad leader. I've got 10 men that I'm responsible for. And my job is to get Humvees in and out of the city every time Task Force Ranger does a mission in Mogadishu, Somalia. I won't go back over all of the details of Somalia, but I will say this. The U.S. and the United Nations were over there as a peacekeeping force to provide food to people, hundreds of thousands of people who were dying from starvation. Literally, I think when we showed up, there was already 350,000 people dead from a famine and starvation. And the United Nations, you maybe remember the Marines landing on the beaches in December of 92 just to provide food to people starving to death. There were some warlords, these are like gang leaders, in the capital city of Mogadishu who were fighting each other. And one of those warlords made the decision to start to target United Nations workers and start to attack U.S. supply convoys. So he started to set roadside bombs, blowing up U.S. supply convoys when they drove through the city streets. And in June of 1993, he ambushed and murdered 24 United Nations workers. This caused the U.N. Security Council to meet together. And the U.N. Security Council said, something must be done about this warlord, a man by the name of Muhammad Farah Idid. Somebody has to remove this guy from power. So the United States assembled Task Force Ranger. It was my unit, a company of rangers from Fort Benning, Georgia, a helicopter unit from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and some special operations soldiers from up and down the east coast of the United States. We went over there with a very different mission. We're not trying to hand out food. We're trying to capture some bad guys if possible, and if not, we're just going to kill them and take them out of the equation. Task Force Ranger did seven missions while we were in Somalia, and each one got a little bit more difficult. But the seventh and final mission we launched on Sunday afternoon, October 3rd. Now, I guess I should tell you this. Um, It's the middle of daylight. This is a a tip that we get that two of the really high-ranking leaders from the Idid clan are meeting in the same building at the same time in the Bakara market, the part of town that's the most dangerous, at the part of town that's controlled by ID. And we knew this was going to be bad going into this thing. But at this point, we've been there for about three months. We thought this was going to take maybe six or eight weeks. And we were getting a lot of pressure from the Clinton administration to wrap this operation up and to get out of there. In fact, the news had started to call Somalia another Vietnam. And Clinton decided, get this thing over with and get out of there as quickly as possible. I'm telling you this because special operators almost only do business at night. And we decide to go do this thing in the middle of the afternoon in broad daylight. And we all knew this is going to be bad. None of us knew how bad it was going to get. 
So we launched this mission, and Blackhawks fly in, and Rangers slide down the ropes. They call it fast rope to the four corners of the target building. Special operators fly in on Little Bird helicopters and assault the target building. And as all of that's going on, I ride in with my squad on a bunch of Humvees and provide some vehicles to get the bad guys and place them on our vehicles. Then everybody flew in by helicopters. We'll put them on our vehicles, and we want to get out of there in less than 30 minutes, or else this is going to go really bad for us. When those helicopters were flying in, and when the rangers were sliding down the ropes, one of those rangers, just like you see in the movie Black Hawk Down, missed the rope. His name is Todd Blackburn, and he fell about 70 feet, and he landed in the city streets head first. So my commander, Colonel Danny McKnight, called me as soon as I arrived to the target building and saying, said, Jeff, I need you to go get to Todd Blackburn, put him on your Humvees, and get him back to our base and get him immediate medical attention. We didn't think that he would make it through the rest of the night. We were already getting gunfire as soon as I arrived at the target building that day. I placed Blackburn on a stretcher with a bunch of medics working on him on a Humvee, split my men in half, put half of my guys on a vehicle in front of them and the other half of my guys on a vehicle behind them and we're going to provide some guns just to get them out of the city and to get them back to our, our surgeon. When we were driving out of the Target building that day, I made a right turn onto a small road, a road that's about half the size of this room. And this little three-vehicle convoy going very slowly down these bumpy roads got ambushed from 200 different directions at the same time. I can't even describe for you the gunfire because it was coming from rooftops and alleyways. People were lobbing hand grenades at us out windows and automatic gunfire from both sides of the road hitting us from every direction. I had a guy on a 50 caliber machine gun who was holding the trigger down and spraying bullets in every direction, trying to return fire. And he really wasn't being very effective that way, so I told him to take his machine gun and face it to the left and pick up all of the enemy fighters to the left. Another guy sitting behind me also had a machine gun. I told him to take his machine gun, face it to the right, pick up everybody to the right. I'd take care of everybody in front of us, Another guy in the back seat would take care of everybody behind us. And now, y'all, we're just fighting for our lives, trying to make it back to the base. And down the road, on the right side of this Humvee, hiding in ambush waiting for us, was a Somali gunman. And when we got right next to him, he saw this machine gunner, a guy by the name of Dominic Pilla, at the same time that Pilla saw him. These two guys turned their weapons to each other, and they shot and killed each other at the exact same instant. And just like you see in the movie Black Hawk Down, I have to make a radio call and tell my boss that Dominic Pilla has just been killed instantly. He's KIA. And at that moment, the entire radio went silent because everybody in those city streets realized this is worse than we thought, and none of us may make it out of the streets alive. I went through a bunch of other obstacles. I won't even tell you about all of them today. But when I finally got back to our base, my platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Morris, walked up to me. And he said, Jeff, a second Black Hawk helicopter has just been shot down. I didn't even know the first one went down. He said, the, on the first crash site, We've already put our search and rescue force. We don't have anybody else to go back out there. I need you to get your men back on your Humvees, go out to the second crash site, and see if anybody is alive where Mike Durant's helicopter just crashed. As he walked away, one of the special operators who came back with me overheard this whole conversation. And he said, hey, Sergeant, if you're really going to go out into those city streets tonight... Don't leave your men in the back of that Humvee sitting in all of that blood. He said, that will mess them up for the rest of their life. So I sent all the rest of my, my soldiers to go get some more fuel, go get some more ammunition. And I pulled this one Humvee off to the side. And we didn't have running water, so it was just buckets and sponges in my bare hands. And I started cleaning up the blood off of the back of this Humvee. And at this moment, I was scared to death. 
There's never been a day in my life before or since that I was terrified like the back of that Humvee. You see, everything inside of me was saying, Jeff, this is a suicide mission. If you go back out there, there is no doubt you will get killed. And not only that, but you've just lost one of your men. The vehicles have been shot to pieces. If you drive your, the rest of your men back through that, all of the rest of your men are going to get killed tonight. There's no doubt you will get killed if you go back out into those city streets. And I'll tell you, to make matters worse, Dawn and I had been married for a couple of years at this point. We've been trying to have a baby. And she sent me a letter right after getting to Somalia saying that she was pregnant with our first child. And everything inside of me was saying, don't go out into those city streets tonight. This is suicide. But here's the problem. Rangers have sworn their lives to one another. They do this in the form of the Ranger Creed. And one of the things that the Ranger Creed says is that I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. I had no choice but to get on those Humvees and go out there, and it scared me to death. I want you to listen carefully, because this is perhaps the most terrifying and maybe one of the greatest moments of my life. Because standing at the back of that Humvee, I started to think, God, I I can't go back onto those city streets. If I do, I know I'm going to die. And I started to just... Just pray, God, I'm in big trouble right now. I need your help. And at that moment, God started to remind me of something that He first showed me at 13 years old. He started to remind me, Jeff, your life is in my hands. It's always been in my hands. What are you worried about? But He also reminded me of this. Jeff, there's really only one of two ways this thing can play out. Maybe by some miracle... I survive, maybe I go back to Fort Benning, Georgia. But if not, because of what Jesus did for me a long time ago, before my body hits the ground, I know exactly where my soul is going to go. Now please listen to this. Because in my mind, I started to think, either I go home to my family in Georgia, or I go home to my Father in Heaven. No matter what happens next, I can't lose. I am better off because of what Jesus did for me 2,000 years ago. And folks, for the rest of the night, I had no fear of dying. I was convinced that I wasn't going to see the light of day. And for the rest of the night, it didn't matter anymore because I know exactly where I was going to spend eternity. God gave me this sense of peace that I couldn't explain to you if I wanted to other than just simply saying, I know exactly where I'm going to go when I die, and I may be there in the next few moments, so bring it on. This became one of the defining moments of my life. In fact, this really was the moment that God used to start to move my life into a different direction, and instead of being a ranger sergeant kicking in doors and killing bad guys, He started to send me towards ministering to warriors, ultimately to become an army chaplain, and then to pastor a church so that I could look men in the eyes and say, I know exactly what you're going through. I've been there myself. And let me tell you the difference. When Jesus is the the king of your soul, let me tell you how different it is on the battlefield. So what that video showed you at the end is I could walk through those city streets of Mogadishu, Somalia, with this bulletproof faith, not worried at all about what happens next. Because I know the one who's got me in the palm of his hand. Now, can we take a look at a verse in the Bible and where Jesus describes this for some of his listeners? Because I think now you may be able to understand what Jesus is saying in John chapter 8. He says in John chapter 8, that he has come to set some people free. Now you need to know that the folks that are listening to Jesus in John chapter 8, please hear this. They're like us in the United States. They're saying, wait a second, Jesus, we live in a free country. 
What do you mean be set free? We're sons of Abraham. We don't need to be set free. This is John chapter 8, starting in verse 32. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you, but Jesus says it this way. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And if he were to say that today, he would get the exact same response today that he got 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. Jesus, we're citizens of a free country. What do you mean be set free? No one is my master. I'm not a slave. Jesus said, oh, you missed the point. Because listen to what he says next. John chapter 8, verse 34. Truly I tell you, anyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. Jesus said, you missed what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about slavery on the outside. I'm talking about slavery on the inside. The same kind of slavery that I had to sin and I had to the fear of death as a young boy. Anyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. And a slave doesn't remain in the household forever. But the son remains forever. He's talking about heaven and the father and the son. Verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will really be free. Or your translation may say, you will be free indeed. Liberty, can I tell you something? Jesus came to give you a gift that you couldn't possibly purchase for yourself. And that gift is the gift of freedom. But not freedom on the outside. He came to give you freedom on the inside. He came to set free your mind from the slavery of sin, the temptation that continues to trip you up over and over again. He came to set your soul free from the bondage of sin. And listen to me, y'all. You can't wash this off. You can't be a good man or a good woman and do enough good deeds to outweigh your sins. That's not how it works. You can't even pray hard enough. You can't give enough money in the offering plate to buy your freedom from this one. No, the Bible makes it very clear. The wages of sin, if you know the rest of the verse, say it out loud, is death. Somebody is going to have to die for this. And Jesus says, instead of you dying for it, I'll die for you. Just like those brave men who started those founding fathers who, who began uh, this American experiment, who tried to create the freest society in human history, most of those men were willing to pledge their lives, if that's what it takes, to make you free. You did nothing to deserve this. Jesus said, I've come to do this for you. And I'm offering you a gift And this gift is so precious that once you're free, you are totally and completely free. Listen, you don't even have to worry about death when I set you free. But if you've not been set free from me, by me, this is what Jesus is saying to us today, you are still a slave to sin. So when I look at an audience like this, I see two types of people. Set free by the the blood of Jesus and people that are still slaves, and they just don't know it. And today, I'm praying that some slaves are set free by the blood of Jesus. In just a second, I'm going to say a prayer. And I'm going to pray that somebody in this room, maybe a number of you in this room, reach out and you receive the free gift that Jesus is offering you today. You take the gift of freedom that as Pastor Brian said just a moment ago, that freedom came at a heavy cost. In fact, for God, that freedom cost God everything so that you could be made free. And today he's offering it to you. And what he's asking you for in return is if you really want to be my disciple, You surrender it all. You lay it all down and place it all at my feet. And then I will set you free, free on the inside. The kind of freedom that nobody else can do for you. Only Jesus can do this for you. Maybe some of you, you've understood this for a long time. And then life happened and you walked away from church. And it's been a long time since you've had this 
really tight relationship with Jesus. Maybe today Jesus is calling you back. But for others in this room who know Jesus and have been walking with him, maybe what you need to do is to walk out the doors of this room and live so free that your neighbors want what you have. So if you don't mind, why don't you just bow your heads? Let me pray for you. And as the musicians come up on stage, I want you to just prepare your heart to respond to whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about right now. Let me say a prayer for you, and maybe somebody in this room will step across the line of faith, and today will be the day you're finally and fully set free. Father, I don't know the folks in this room, but you do. And you love them, and you've given up your son as payment for their sins. Which says, if it was humanly possible for us to get to heaven on our own, like if we could be good enough, or if we could be religious enough to get there on our own, you didn't need to do this. But God, you know that once you're a slave, a slave is a slave forever until someone steps in and gives them freedom. And I believe your son Jesus wants to set some people free right now. So God, I pray for somebody in this room who maybe for the first time in their life, the light bulb came on. Maybe for the first time in their life, they understood it. I'm a sinner and I can't do enough. I can't give enough. I can't be good enough to become free from my sins. My sins are holding me bondage and somebody has to rescue me on the inside. And that's why you sent your son Jesus, who lived the perfect life, who died the payment for my sins. And then they took that body off of the cross and laid him in a tomb. And three days later, the man who was dead came back to life as proof of his message. Not only that, but proof that all who believe in him, though we die, we will still live again. And God, I pray that right now somebody in this room will just cry out a simple prayer of faith. Maybe silently in their heart they would be willing to say something like this, God, I'm a sinner. I can't be good enough. I see it today. I can't do anything to become free from my sin. But you love me. And you sent your son Jesus to rescue me. He went on a suicide mission for me. And right here, right now, God, you know me. You know this is real. Right now, God, I am turning from my sins. I'm laying it all down and saying, with your help, I'm turning my back on all of those sins and I'm not going to live like that anymore. And God, right here, right now, between me and you, I am turning to your son, Jesus, and I'm surrendering it all to him. Holy Spirit, if that prayer is real, you know it. If it's coming from a sincere heart, you honor it. And I believe you can transform somebody right in their seat right now. Father, maybe somebody in this room is like the prodigal son or daughter who's made some mistakes even after they knew Jesus and their life got complicated and they messed up and they walked away. And today, you're drawing them back to yourself. In just a moment, would you give them the courage to come down front and to let some of these counselors know the decision that they're making? And for the believers in this room, the men and women who have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, when they walk out the doors of this room, would you make them the kind of witnesses, the people all over the state of Georgia, all over the United States, all over the world, see these men and women are different. They've got something that's transformed them. They've got something that I want because they live their life without fear. They live their life free, fully free by the blood of Jesus. God, do what only you can do right now. And would you receive the glory as people respond to your gospel this morning? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're making some kind of commitment in just a second, I'm going to ask.